But let's begin by reading from chapter 1, verse 1 of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we trust that God will bless his word to every one of us that's heard it today. I was interested when I came to look at this book again, just to think a little bit about the background and the reason perhaps that John gives for writing this fourth gospel that we know in the Bible. You remember that there are four gospels that have been written, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But as you read through John's gospel, it is unique in many ways. There are many stories that only occur in John's gospel. And there's a particular uh, emphasis that he gives to showing that the Lord Jesus is not just the Christ, the Messiah, the one that the nation of Israel was looking for, but that he is the Son of God. And as we learnt last week, that he is not only the Son of God, but he is God himself. He has all the attributes of God. And as we noticed in verse 1, it begins by saying this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John, right at the very beginning, he begins to establish the credentials and who Jesus Christ is. He is God. But if you come to the end of his book, he tells us the reason why he wrote this book. And he says in verse 31 of chapter 20, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So his book isn't just written in order to prove that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God, but it's written so that you and I might believe and by believing that he is the Son of God, we might have life through his name. Now, perhaps the situation that John found himself in caused him particularly to put pen to paper to write this gospel. He, of course, was an eyewitness of many of the things that he writes about. He was with the Lord Jesus. He was a disciple uh, right from the earliest days. So he had an eyewitness account of all that took place and what he saw, he wrote. But he's now likely a very old man as he writes this book. People suggest that it was perhaps written in around about AD 85 to AD 90, and John being born somewhere around just in the early years in the 80s. So perhaps an older man in his 80s or 90s. And the political landscape had changed from the times of the Lord Jesus when he had been on earth some 50 to 60 years before. There had been a change of Roman Empire, Emperor to a man by the name of Domitian. Now if you know anything about the ancient Roman Empire, you'll, you'll know that this man in particular, he introduced something new. He introduced a requirement on people to worship him as a deity. He made a claim that he was the son of Jupiter the Jupiter being 
the highest ranking uh, deity amongst the Roman gods in that time. And so he claimed that he was the son of Jupiter and demanded that all of the subjects of the Roman Empire should worship him. Now that of course caused a, a massive problem for Christians and likely John himself. You see, the, the Christians believed that there was only one Son of God. There was only one God and that his Son had come into the world and that man should never be worshipped at any kind of level, let alone on a par with God. And so John writes this gospel to tell people without any shadow of a doubt that there is one God and that there is one Saviour and one Son of God who came into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he knew in writing this that if people believed it and if people would not subject themselves to the order of the Emperor, that he was putting people's lives on the line, people would die, people did die because they wouldn't bow down to a man, but they confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Now that shows you then the importance that this book plays. John writing now, knowing that many of his contemporaries and that he himself would die, lose their lives, be martyred, if they held on to their belief that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. In the verses that we have read, you'll notice, though, that reading down from verse 6 to verse 14, John introduces us to an, another metaphor, if you like, or another title of the Lord Jesus, and that's to him being the light. And on a number of occasions, he refers to the Lord Jesus as the light. When you come into chapter 8 and to chapter 9 of John's Gospel, you hear the Lord Jesus referring to himself as the light. And on both occasions, he refers to himself as the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. Now, I would like then to consider for a few moments this evening about the significance of the title and what it means. Now, you know, when you think about light, you think about something that reveals things, something that shows things that would otherwise never be known. If you were in a room that was completely dark, you wouldn't know what else was in the room with you. You wouldn't be able to see you would be oblivious to everything around you. And likewise, in a spiritual sense, the Bible says that without the Lord Jesus in our lives, we too are in darkness. That means to say not that we cannot see physical things, but we cannot see spiritual things. We can't understand the things of God. We can't perceive things as God would see them. And so we need light in order to see it. And when the Lord Jesus came and declared himself to be the light of the world, what he was really saying was this, I am the one that makes sense of spiritual things. I'm the one that enlightens spiritual things. I can show you the meaning of spiritual things. And I want to look at four of the things that we find in these few verses that we have read together. Now, the first thing that I'd like you to see is this. The Lord Jesus made sense of the purpose of human history and of humanity itself and of world history. He says in verse 10, it says concerning him, he was in the world and the world was made by him. If you were to listen to scientists and, and atheistic scientists, perhaps today, there's a, a growing chorus of people that say, that there is no purpose to this world. It was an accident. It came from an accident, from a big bang. It, we are just atoms all joined together, strings of DNA with no purpose, heading on to a, a, a purposeless future until perhaps one day the whole universe either collapses on itself or energy runs out. And it's a meaningless existence. To follow that through to its logical conclusion, you have to say your life and my life are uh, completely worthless. They have no purpose. You have no value. All you are is just atoms or DNA held together. But the Bible's perspective is altogether different from that. And in particular, the Lord Jesus is the light that shows us the purpose of world history, the purpose of why we're here and what life is all about. 
I suggest to you perhaps that in these days in particular with COVID-19, a lot of people perhaps have realized and had to reconsider what the point of life is. Some people had lived for football, but in COVID-19 world, there's no football. Some had lived for their families to go and see them and, and that was really what kept them going. And as nice as those occasions are, they've been prevented during the lockdown. And people live for careers, people live for their work, their, their advancement in, in uh, their uh, employment. And sadly for many, their jobs have been lost. Or well, for many, they're unable to work. And the whole work landscape has changed. And for others, it was just the accumulation of money, but the COVID-19 has, has put a quite a dent in the share market. And everything perhaps that people wondered what life was for, the purpose of life, has in many ways been pulled out from underneath them. And it causes us then to ask a question, what is the point of it all? But you'll notice that in these verses we find particularly and, and quite clearly that there is one purpose to it all, and that is the Lord Jesus himself. If he was the creator, as we learnt about last week, where it says in verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Then he brought this world into being. He had a purpose for it. He made it for a reason. And that includes you and I. Everything that is in this world has been made for a reason, has a purpose. Now, I, I suggest to you that that is the only thing that can give life meaning. It, it, it sheds light on what the whole purpose of human history is. It was made by him. If you were to turn to another book in Colossians in the Bible, you'll find this, that it wasn't just made by him or through him. It was made for him. He was the heir of all things, the Bible says. In other words, it's like a, the father has a son whom he intends to give a great inheritance to. And that is the way that the Bible pictures the relationship between the father and the son in the Godhead. The father delights to give an inheritance to his son. This world and everything is moving towards something, a goal. And that goal is that everything one day will be headed up under the Lord Jesus. It will all be for him. Now that brings us then to this conclusion, that if it was all made by him and it was for him, then you and I must mean something to him. And we do. The verse goes on to say this, he came unto his own and his own received him not. He came. If you want to see the main reason and evidence why you can know for sure that God is interested in you. You can just take these two words, he came. He left heaven to come down. A staggering thing. But it shows you that the whole point of history is, it's for him. He's come into this world that he might save us. We mean something to him. And he proved that by dying for us, for our sins on the cross. But I want to see that not only is he the point of history and shedding light on the meaning of life and why we're all here and what it's all for, that he is the ultimate goal of it all. But I want you to see as well that he sheds light on what the real problem with man is. You see, this is something perhaps at times that is lost on many people. What ultimately is wrong with the world? People sometimes begin with some of the great crimes against humanity. And they might give you a list of all of the things, and even if you were just to look down through the last century of human history, to look at the, the, the awful genocides that have taken place, you could begin by going back a century or so, back to the Ottoman Empire, and, and you have uh, an awful genocide against the Armenian people. Over 1.5 million people lost their lives. You come a little further in history and you have the genocide uh, that was committed out committed in Cambodia by Pol Pot and three million Cambodians lost their lives or the genocide and the extermination or attempted extermination of the Jewish people by Hitler and historians suggest over six million 
lost their lives. And we can think of awful tragedies and crimes against humanity. And people say that's really where the problem lies. But the Lord Jesus, when he was here, he shone light on what the ultimate problem was. And it isn't just what people do, that's the problem. Because if it was just what people do, then you might be able to change it. But what the Lord Jesus really showed was this, it wasn't so much what people did that was the problem, it was why they did it. And that was ultimately the problem of sin and the problem that lies within the heart of every single one of us. It might demonstrate itself in different ways in different people and some sins you might uh, be aghast at and others perhaps you might turn an eye to, particularly your own. But the Lord Jesus said really the fundamental problem with everyone is that sin has come into the world and sin not only has come into the world in general but it has come into our own heart. In showing you precisely what the problem was, he, he makes mention a few times to this fact that the greatest crime of humanity that would ever be committed was not crimes against man, but it was crimes against God. And in particular, he makes mention to this in chapter seven, his own family, his brothers, at this point in time, they really don't believe who he is. And they ask him, why don't you go up to Jerusalem? Why don't you go up to the temple and do some miracles? What he says is, you don't really understand why I've come. And you don't understand the way in which I have to deal with the problems of this world. I can't just do things the way that you expect. He said, here is the ultimate problem. He says, the world cannot hate you in verse seven of chapter seven, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now what the Lord Jesus draws attention to is this. The greatest problem of this world and the greatest problem of the world in which the Lord Jesus came into was not so much even the worst of crimes against people, but it was the crime that they committed against the Lord Jesus and the reason for it. And that was this, they hated him. And ultimately, the reason why they crucified him wasn't because they didn't have enough evidence to know who he was. The reason why they crucified him was because they hated him and they wanted rid of him. You can trace that as you read through John's gospel, actually, and you come near to the trial of the Lord Jesus. And in chapter 12 you'll, and chapter 11, you'll find this, that the leaders of the Jews and the chief priests and so on, they, they take a council together to get rid of him. And it isn't because it's a theological question. It isn't because they're doubting that he's the son of God. But what they realize is this, he is now a threat to them. They see him as a threat to everything that they had built up in their religion and that they would lose it all. And so they say that it would be better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. In their minds, he would destabilize society. Everybody was following him. He'd raised a man from the dead in Lazarus and now the whole world was turning to him apparently as they saw it. And so they thought that great, the one great thing that they could do would be to get rid of him, to kill him. And the Bible says it was for envy and out of jealousy and out of hatred that they had him crucified. The real reason, the real problem within the human heart is ultimately this, man sees God as a threat. And because of that, man envies God. And as a sense of jealousy that will right at the very beginning. If you go to go back to the time of Adam and Eve and the early chapters of Genesis, you'll find this is exactly the same problem. Adam and Eve wanted what God had. Satan convinced them that God was keeping something from them and that if they could only have what they weren't allowed, then they would suddenly have freedom. And they essentially wanted to be in control of their lives. They didn't want God to rule. They didn't want God to dictate. And the Lord Jesus is when he came, he showed people, he shone light on this problem, that the real problem within the human heart is that man doesn't want God. But there's something else. And in verse uh, 13, he shows us not only what the problem with the human heart is, but how it is that somebody could actually be right with God and become a child of God. Now this ought to be staggering to every one of us. 
He's just said in verse 11 that he came unto his own and his own received him not. His own people, they rejected him and crucified him. And you would wonder why God would ever put up with man. Why God wouldn't just destroy man for what the most heinous and outrageous crime that's ever been committed. When man, God's own creature, took the Son of God and crucified him. But John goes on to say this, but, this little word, but, despite the awful crime of rejecting Christ, the Bible says, but, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The Lord Jesus made it clear, as the light of the world, he would make it clear exactly on what terms somebody becomes a child of God. And this verse shows us this, he says, but as many as received him. Now you say, what does it mean to receive him? I can't receive him, he's not physically here, not as it was for the people that were here in his day. But he goes on to say at the end of the verse, even to them that believe on his name. So to receive him was to believe on him. To believe him is to receive him. They're really in some senses interchangeable. To believe on his name means that we believe all that he is. His name was really the sum total of all of his attributes, that he was a man, that he's God, that he came, that he died, that he's alive, that he rose from the dead, that he's coming back again. To believe on him is to believe all that Jesus Christ is, that he's the son of God and a savior, that he loves me, that he died for me. But then he goes on then to show what doesn't save somebody? He says, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. One thing to notice at the beginning of verse 13 is this, it says, which were born. Salvation and becoming a child of God is an instantaneous process. You're born into the family of God. You're born of God. The Lord Jesus explained this to Nicodemus in chapter 3. He says, you must be born again. You must be born from above. And that shows this, that Christianity or becoming a Christian is not something that takes place over years, years of study or, or years of trying or years of uh, saying prayers or whatever it might be. It's an instantaneous thing. Somebody is born of God. But the things that don't achieve it are this. It's not of blood. That means you can't inherit it. It's not something that can be passed down from generation to generation. It's not of the will of the flesh. In other words, it's not brought about by efforts of man or my own efforts. And Paul makes this clear when he writes in Ephesians chapter 2. And he says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul makes it clear that it's not a matter of human effort. Salvation is a gift that's given to God. It's not of the will of the flesh. But then he says it's not of the will of man. In other words, somebody else can't do it for you. And that would put pay to any ideas that you could be sprinkled and become a child of God. And as a baby, that something could happen to you. Somebody could do something to you and you could be born of God. In fact, verse 12 makes that clear. But as many as received him, this is an individual thing. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe on him, you're born of God. I'll finish by saying this. The Lord Jesus also shines light on who God is. Right from the very beginning of human history, Satan has attempted to undermine the character of God. He's the liar from the beginning, the father of lies. And the great lie he sowed into the heart of Adam and Eve, he's sown into the hearts of men and women that you can't trust God. And when John and the other disciples saw the Lord Jesus, they were looking on the very heart of God himself. They were looking at the character of God. They saw the life of God. And John says this, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to know what God is like? 
Look at the Lord Jesus. He died for you. He came that he might bear away our sin, that through believing in him we might have life. And truth, John says it was full of grace and truth. And one thing they came to realize about the Lord Jesus was this, everything he said was true. And that included invitations that he made to people and an invitation that he extends to you today. He said this, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that applies to all of us. Him that cometh to me, if you come to him, come in faith. You can't come in person. You can't come physically, but you can come in faith to the Lord Jesus and ask him to save you. And if you come to him, the Bible says he'll never cast you out.